Hello and welcome to this video. Last night, as I was going to bed, ready to go to sleep, a couple of people on Facebook sent me a link to a video, which I clicked on, rather disinterestedly, because I get sent a lot of these links. And lo and behold, I saw full footage, a good 10 minutes worth, of the legendary trio Tony Williams Lifetime in all their glory. I knew exactly what this footage was. This was the supposedly lost footage from their session with on the TV show Beat Club in 1970. For many years people have um, wondered whether this existed. Now if you go onto the internet and have a search you will find that we did have some footage of the original uh, Lifetime about one minute of them on Beat Club, and you can go and see it. Uh, it's got a chroma keyed background, it looks slightly different to what we're looking at with this footage. Um, and on that footage you see them going to something, they don't really kick in, they play for about a minute, and then suddenly it stops, John McLaughlin rolls his eyes, and um, then an announcer comes on in German and says, um, we didn't have Tony Williams on the show because they were arrogant and wouldn't adhere to the sort of rules of the show. Um, now what had actually happened was um, Lifetime wanted to play their tunes uh, as a sort of medley, as a suite, very much like Miles Davis used to do at the time. They wanted to go from one tune to the next without stopping. Now uh, Beat Club is a show that started in 1965 and is essentially a pop show. Um, in, here in the UK we had a show called Top of the Pops and it was very much that type of show. Um, except um, not for the whole lifetime of the show but for most of the lifetime of the show, and I wish I'd use the word lifetime there because I'm going to confuse myself, but um, for, they, uh, they had live performances on. But essentially it's a pop show, and on a pop show they want someone to come on, perform a three minute song, and then perform another three minute song so they can edit it and cut it. And Tony Williams' Lifetime wouldn't do this, and uh, they stuck by their guns and so they got kicked off. Um, People have wondered whether the actual footage got shot because obviously they must have performed and played. Well, they did, and here it is in all its glory. Um, so why was I shocked watching it? Well, I think the reason is, is because when I watched it, it wasn't just the fact that here was, for the first time, some really solid, you know, footage of the Tony Williams lifetime with John McLaughlin on um, guitar, Larry Young on keyboard, such an important a group in the history of jazz rock and jazz and we could finally see them that's a shock it is a shock but it's more than that for me so um if you haven't seen the footage i'm going to show a bit now i'm going to show just a minute or so now just so you can get a flavor so uh, this is what i saw Right, so um, any, any Tony Williams lifetime, lifetime fans, Mavish Norkshire fans, John McLaughlin fans, Tony Williams fans, that is an incredible bit of footage, isn't it? And uh, I think that um, the reason why I was shocked by it was because it made me question, and or, or not necessarily question, but it made me um, appreciate deeper what was going on at that time to really create this genre that we love so much. Now, why is this so important? Why is it so important to uh, find out where jazz rock started? Well, most musicians, their playing style, regardless of their um, style of music they play, their basic playing style is rooted in um, a bunch of really legendary musicians that were based in the styles and approaches of jazz rock. I myself have, have not played that much jazz rock as a musician. I've played prog and I've played folk music. I've played reggae. I've played um, bangra. I've played all sorts of things in my career. But my playing style is rooted in the drummers 
like Tony Williams that came out of this style. So it's very important, I think, if you're interested in music history, to see where this comes from. And watching this footage, it changed my opinion. All right. Um, we know that Tony Williams' Lifetime is a very important band for the development of jazz rock. We know that. But watching this, I suddenly had had the realization that um, two of the guys here came out of Miles Davis's group. That um, John McLaughlin was brought to America by Tony Williams to form this group. And this group was going to be the group where Tony Williams freed himself from the confines of the Miles Davis uh, group. Now in the Miles Davis group, he had um, made such groundbreaking music, but I think around about 1968, 69, he's listening to Jimi Hendrix and he's listening to like Velvet Underground and he's listening to all these sorts of alternative music. And he wants to be a part of that. This guy at that time is 22 years old. And he goes and recruits a guitarist that is versed in jazz, right? But has also had an upbringing in London in the 60s where all this exciting um, mishmash of styles is coming together to really create rock. And one of the bands that is, is so important in the development of progressive music in heavy metal and jazz rock is Cream. And what we see here is Lifetime with Jack Bruce. Now, Jack Bruce was not a original member of Lifetime. He came in on the second album. Um, the first album, famously, is an incendiary album. It's almost like free electric jazz rather than jazz rock. It was um, poorly recorded, and so although it's groundbreaking and incredible, we don't really get to hear the band properly. There's always been this question, what were the band really like? And you read uh, reviews of people seeing them live, and live it seemed like an incredibly loud, heavy, you know, um, anarchic music. It was heavy. And the first album doesn't sound that heavy. The engineers didn't know how to record it. It's, it's terribly recorded. The second album loses some of the fire and is, is re recorded better. And we have the inclusion of Jack Bruce, but not on every single track. It still, on the whole, sounds like Emergency. Larry Young, John McLaughlin, Tony Williams. So Jack Spruce's in input into the band is was not that great. Then they obviously go out on tour. And what we see here in 1970 is the band now is a, a quartet with Jack Bruce on vocals and bass. Now this is really important because we now have Tony Williams from the Miles Davis band. We have John McLaughlin who's played with Miles Davis and this was almost poached by Miles Davis and was offered to join Miles's band and wouldn't do it. And apparently, then Miles said, well, this group you've got, I want that to be my group. And Tony Williams said, no, this is my group with my vision for my tunes and my composition. John McLaughlin's also made the decision to go with Tony Williams because he would be able to bring his compositions in. And then the elephant in the room is Larry Young. Now, Larry Young is or was an incredible organist that took that tradition of the jazz organ trio, you know, um, Jimmy Smith, Jack McDuff. Um, and he, people say he then put the language of Coltrane in, but for me, he brought his own language in because Larry Young, is, he creates spaces and structures and sound. It's electronica. And so what, he, what we have with Larry Young is the cutting edge of electric jazz. There was already an electric jazz tradition in the jazz trio. So we now have this perfect storm of a band with all these elements in. And what happened to that band? It goes nowhere. Now, why does it go nowhere? Well, originally when the band was formed, they were offered a contract with Columbia Records. Columbia had already signed um, Miles Davis. This is a major label, Clive Davis, um, what did I just I've got, I've got a Miles Davis and a Clive Davis. So, yeah, Miles Davis is on Columbia Records. Clive Davis runs Columbia Records. And he was willing to put a lot of money into these fusion bands. He put a lot of money into Weather Report. And he put a lot of money into the Mahavish Doctor. The Mahavish Doctor had more push behind it. It was better produced. Um, so really, we could see that... Um, Tony Williams' Lifetime's Thunder was stolen by the Mahavish Doctor. Because... The Mavish Ducks should then grab that proper deal and replaced Tony Williams with Billy Cobham, another 
Miles Davis alumnus. This is this is fascinating. So what it's made me realise is that this is a big stew of stuff. And the question is, is it Miles Davis that's going to win out? Is it Tony Williams' lifetime that's going to win out? Or is it the Mavish Nuxha? Now history shows it was the Mavish Nuxha. Now when we watch this footage, what we see is fascinating because they basically pay, play four tunes or segue to, together. And um, they open up with three, a, a, a quiet three chord vamp that's going backwards and forth in seven. This eventually is going to crop up on the intro to Trilogy by the Mavish Nuxha that is on Between Nothing and Eternity. So the first thing they open up is a proto-Mavish new tune, right? But it's a tune being played by a different band with a different approach. They then drop into an incredibly um, furious bass riff um, in seven and go into a, a song by um, Jack Bruce, which is was going to be on his Harmony Row album. It's going to appear the following year. Um, and who's who's on that album? I think, is it John Marshall on drums and Chris Spedding on guitar? Uh, the tune's called Smiles and Grins. Or Grins and Smiles, can't remember. All right. And it's interesting that Jack Bruce is on record of saying that Harmony Row was his greatest solo album. So we could see here Jack Bruce has got a vision of this type of fusion. And he's the originator of Jazz, jazz Fusion back in Cream. So he's got his vision of it. John McGoffin has got his vision of it. Tony Williams has got his vision of it, right? They then, they drop into Devotion, which is a tune by John McLaughlin off his album Devotion, right? When we listen to the album Devotion, we really hear the seeds of the Mavish Nuxtra. Now, when Devotion came out, a number of people covered tunes off that record on different records. Brian Auger um, covered Dragon Song on his album. Can't remember the title of his album. Um, and uh, also there was a, a, a trio, short-lived trio called Good God that also did a version of Div um, Dragon Song. And I'm going to talk about Good God in the future at some point. When we hear that, when we hear John McLaughlin's tunes taken by those, we hear the sound of the Mavish Nuxtra. Brian Olga really does something incredible on that album. It sounds like the Mavish Nuxtra when you hear it. And that album came in, out in 71, the same year as the Mavish Nuxtra. John McLaughlin's ideas basically are being channeled through a number of different elements and then you can see John, M John McLaughlin must have said and he was he was um, told to do this by Miles Davis go and form, form your own band before then I was thinking he was trying to do it within another ensemble he has the idea of forming his own band right they then finish with a version of Dance of Maya by the Mavish Nocturne now this is absolutely fascinating to me because um, it sounds incredible, but different because it's a different band. And most importantly, um, Jack Bruce is singing. Dance of May at this point is a song. And when you listen to the lyrics, at one point, I'm sure he says the lyric, Purpose of When. Now, Purpose of When was a track that was on Devotion. So I can infer that those lyrics could well have been written by John McLaughlin. So what we have here is Tony Williams' lifetime, not playing any of Tony Williams' compositions, but playing three compositions by John McLaughlin and a composition by Jack Bruce. So in other words, you could see that John McLaughlin's um, star is on the rise. He, he is taking over. Now, if that music contract had gone to um, to Tony Williams' lifetime, the Columbia contract, then that this band would have had the support and we would have a jazz rock genre really created by the vision of John McLaughlin, which is what I think this shows for me, um, but it would sound completely different. This band with Jack Bruce on bass and vocals Tony Williams on drums, John McLaughlin on um, guitar, and Larry Young on keyboards, organ. It's an incredible lineup. A lineup that we haven't appreciated up until now because to the, the Tony Williams lifetime has always been seen as the trio. And then Jack Bruce uh, jumped in at a later date. And many critics have said that, jazz, that Jack Bruce upset the apple cart. I'm sure this is just through, through a sort of prejudice of thinking, well, Jack Bruce is a rock musician and he's not. He was an incredibly able jazz musician that had his roots in a classical training. He was a phenomenal player and he could have easily have handled the um, 
compositions of John McLaughlin. So, what would it have been like if this band had existed? Because this footage isn't just important because we can see the Tony Williams lifetime. It's perhaps the greatest um, example and one of the, probably the only example of what this group, this quartet sounded like and what could have been if they'd have kept going. And what we would have had is a style of music which was vocal based. Now, if we look at progressive rock, which is very similar to jazz rock, and then we look at jazz rock, the sales, album sales are huge for um, progressive rock. And you could argue that that music is as challenging as out there as, as anything that the Mavish Nocturne did, but with vocals, and I've worked in the industry, as soon as you put a vocal on something, it, it's 10 times more accessible. You know, instrumental music is in a, is in a esoteric minority box straight away. Um, so, if we'd had vocals, we would have had a style that I think was much more progressive rock based and would have integrated itself into the genre of progressive rock. And who knows, we might have seen album sales equivalent to Dark Side of the Moon or Close to the Edge or King Crimson for that matter. Um, we can see when we, when we watch the aesthetic of this video that what Robert Fripp goes on to doing King Crimson in 1972 with John Wetton on bass and vocals is very similar. And I wonder how much of an influence this actual Jack Bruce lineup was. There's one more thing I want to say before I finish. Um, Tony Williams had an idea and his idea, as I said, was to recruit John McLaughlin um, into his band. And he went to the extent of actually pulling him over from London to New York and John McLaughlin made the big jump of having to you know leave everything he's behind his family and all that type of stuff and make his way to New York On arriving in New York he is the X Factor and um, even though he's there to see Tony Williams he is um, grabbed by Miles Davis he plays on um, In a Silent Way in Bitches Brew and he goes from a working musician to a, a legend within jazz for his his input into those groups Tony Williams has spotted this, all right? Um, I don't think if John McLaughlin hadn't been on those Miles Davis albums, they would have been, wouldn't have been as successful. Um, John McLaughlin becomes Miles' muse to the point where he names a track after him on Bitches Brew. Um, Tony Williams, once um, John McLaughlin and the Mavish Dogs have the big deal and they all leave, what has he lev left with? He, he brings in a guitarist called Ten Ted Dunbar. He's a great guitarist, but the magic's not there. Until we get to 1976, and he revamps the lifetime with Alan Holdsworth on guitar. Bizarrely, another guitarist from Yorkshire, another guitarist had come through the London scene and then gone to America to join Tony Williams' lifetime. This is a bizarre thing. It's like you couldn't write this. You couldn't make it up. And Alan Holdsworth's input into the album Believe It, um, finally Tony Williams delivers the groundbreaking legendary fusion album, but I'm afraid he delivers it five years too late, which is unfair because without a doubt, this guy had a vision of what could be. But the problem is I think that um, John McLaughlin had the compositions. Um, throughout the end of the 70s, Tony Williams sort of disappears from viewer, but he doesn't do that much. And the reason is because he's really studying composition. He's studying the compositions of Mahler. He's studying the compositions of, of, of modern classical music. Um, he then comes back in the 80s with his, um, his jazz group, uh, which seems like he's gone backwards. Um, this is the group that he had when he signed to Blue Note Records. Um, I love that group and when I listen to it I can hear that that's a vehicle for Tony Williams' um, new compositional skills, right? Um, towards the end of his life he made two albums, they have to be mentioned. One is Wilderness, which has featured Stanley Clark, Herbie Hancock, uh, Pat Metheny, Michael Brecker and uh, once you get back the past the sort of funky track at the beginning. It's um, Tony Williams' compositions integrated into a sort of jazz quintet. It's an incredible album. Finally, we see Tony Williams' compositional approach fully realized. And he also 
with a huge drum kit with double bass drums made an album with Bill Laswell called Akana, The Ark of Testimony. And for me, this is one of the greatest jazz rock albums of all time. So, um, Tony Williams was on a quest and I believe he got there before he died so sadly at the age of 51 having a routine operation on his gallbladder, having his gallbladder removed. Um, just seeing that footage has given me a much greater insight into the negotiations that were going on within jazz and jazz rock at that time. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm now going to let you go and you can go and watch the footage, you know, completely and hopefully some of the ideas that I've discussed will give you a little bit of an extra insight into what's going on. And if it does, and you have any ideas that I didn't think of, put them in the comments below. Anyway, that's the end of this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.